Chapter 3. Outthink, Outsmart, Outstumble. Watch your step, cripple head. One of the football players muttered as he stuck his leg out in front of my cane. I'm good, I replied, waving the cane above his foot and walking right past him. Thanks, though. I had been acting like I needed to rely on it for every step today in order to throw the bullies off. Not five minutes into the day, and it had already proved necessary. A couple of the thug's friends snickered as he stumbled and nearly fell from his own trick. You fake lying motherfuck! I heard him begin to shout, then tuned him out with two years of practice. I had a free ticket out of this place to earn. He could keep all the curses and football he wanted if I could keep my full scholarship and go on to earn my architectural engineering degree. And yes, that's a real degree. People would make fun of me if they knew, but I still wanted to design cities. Actual, real cities that people lived their lives and sought their dreams in. People told me that I was ridiculous because no one thought they'd be interested in living in a completely new town these days. And no one believed an old city could really be fixed up either. But that was still my dream. Either reconstruct a city that was falling apart, making it a much better place to live in, or else build a brand new place that people could find new opportunities in. Call me crazy, but I swore I'd never give up on that. Enough, I told myself with a smile. Gotta earn all that first. I walked into the room that would have my English test, still barely needing the cane. I was just a little more dizzy, my hands shaking just a little more than they were in the morning. But I was probably just imagining that because I was nervous. And if it was getting worse, well, screw it. I was tired of letting this condition limit me. I was going to succeed today no matter what, and no person or disability was going to stop me. Not this time. Miss Springson looked up at me and smiled as I entered the room. She was in her early thirties with curly blonde hair that she kept short like Mom did, and she dressed in a way that looked like she was trying to strike a balance between professional and relatable to students. Good morning, Wes, she said with her honest smile. I didn't know why, but I swear most of us students worked harder just because of the way she smiled at us. It wasn't like it was some supermodel smile. It was just something that said, I believe in you and I won't stop until you realize it. How are you feeling today? She asked. I knew she meant it, and not in a pitying way. She was hoping for a good answer, that I was doing well was still trying to succeed and grasp awesome things in life. We all loved her for it. Well, those of us that tried it all loved her for it. I feel really great, Miss Springson. I feel like overcoming my condition, rocking my English exam, and earning my scholarship back. Oh, that's what I like to hear, she said cheerfully. In that case, why don't we go ahead and get started? I took a seat and began. Miss Springson started to read out the instructions and accommodations provided. I raised my hand to interrupt. Miss Springson, I said. I'm aware that I may not have access to as many accommodations in college. If it's all right, can you try giving me the time updates as if a normal student's time had passed? That comment got me another smile. It turned out I was able to finish the English section without any accommodations at all. And I thought I had written a killer essay about overcoming personal challenges but I knew for a fact now that my memory was back. That knowledge alone was enough to bring tears of joy to my eyes. But I had to hold myself together until all my tests were done, so I held the waterworks in check for now. I walked out of the classroom, dodging a casual push from another bully on my way out. No strategy that time, just practice from being pushed as soon as I walked around a doorway. Not even bothering to acknowledge the jerk, I did a fist pump into the air. A third of my scholarship had already been saved. I just knew it. Today was going to be a good day. As part of my accommodations, I was allowed a study hall for my next period, then lunch, then my last two tests. Again, no problems. For the study hall, I mean. Lunch was a different story. Wearing the leather helmet was going to be really awkward in the cafeteria. Miss Springson was nice enough not to comment on it, and I was used to jeers in the hallways anyway. But I didn't like having to sit there eating lunch 
with about a hundred people staring at my funny-looking helmet. So before I left my study period for lunch, I pulled out my jacket and beanie to try and hide my helmet as much as possible. People were going to still stare and snicker, but at least there wouldn't be full-blown laughter this way. As much as I tried to pretend otherwise, that still bothered me. I went ahead and found a table where no one else was sitting and pulled up there. Not so long ago, I had a lot more friends at this school. Don't get me wrong, I was never super popular, but with pretty good grades, some decent, not great, just decent, performance on the football team, and being generally known as a nice guy, I'd been able to get along with just about anybody. In addition to the disability caused by my head injury, two things changed all that. The first happened at a party at the end of my sophomore year. The junior quarterback was hosting the party at his parents' second home, the one they never really stayed at. So there wasn't a lot of supervision, and us being teenagers, we used the excuse to get hammered. Well, not all of us. Believe it or not, not every single teenager is crazy about alcohol, and at the time I was really worried about disappointing my parents, especially my dad. Growing up, my dad had been my hero all my life. It's hard to explain why. Part of it was seeing a lot of people respect him, not because of his money or position, but for how he treated people. Part of it was how he showed me all the fun things in life. He played football and catch with me, and when I discovered video games, he showed me how they worked, since he helped program them at his company. He and Mom read stories to me, taught me how to treat people, how to be chivalrous to girls and to not care that holding the door open was old-fashioned to people. And whenever I did the right thing, he let me know and told me I was making a difference in the world. I grew up all my life thinking that I couldn't ask for a better father. And, yes, this party happened before his suicide, so I was still worried about disappointing him. So I stayed sober for the whole thing, which means I have a different memory than most of the other people there that night. Their story is that I got between the quarterback and his girlfriend because I was an overly stuck-up prude trying to ruin everyone's fun, and that I had a secret crush on her. My story is that I stopped the quarterback and at least two other guys from taking advantage of an unconscious girl. It caused a big stink, partly because I didn't know the exact best way to handle that situation, but my parents had taught me enough that I knew I actually had to try and do something. So I got between the guys and girl and started shouting at them. All things considered, I was lucky, because even back when I was in shape, the three of them still could have kicked my ass easily. Instead, a few of the other sober people acted after I did, and everyone went to separate corners to calm down. The party ended early, parents arrived and intervened, and the whole thing was hushed over. Eventually. A couple of parents wanted my head for spreading lies about their babies, but... Some others argued that a parent should have been at the party to begin with, and that my intervention in whatever happened probably prevented some scandal-creating photos from being released. By the way, here's a pro tip for parents. If your child is a 200-pound linebacker and you're concerned about other kids making fun of him, don't call him a baby in public. At any rate, most people felt like I had attacked and tarnished their reputations including the girl I had tried to defend. She got my face over it one day in the school hallways, and shortly afterwards transferred to another school. I never talked to her again. A few weeks later, I found that I had a lot fewer friends on the football team. But my father told me he was proud of me, so I got through that spring and summer all right and just put up with everything. But the fall was different. About three weeks into the new school year, we came home, to my dad, sitting limp in his office. There was a small red hole in the front of his head, and a larger one in the back, with blood on the floor directly under both holes. When we all had finished screaming and uh, calling the police, we found that there was a note on his desk, typed and printed off of his computer. In it, he had apologized to us for living a double life, and for the inappropriate relationships he had with three of the young girls in church. Kids the church had sponsored through a new homeless ministry and that our entire family had been very close to. When we finished reading that note, 
we all started screaming again. At that point, we knew he'd been murdered and framed, because there was no way in hell my father would ever have done a single thing that note said he did. We told the police as much when they finally came. We shouted and demanded that they find Dad's killer right now and find those girls so that they could prove his innocence. They found the girls. And every single one of them testified against my father. The police and Child Protective Services said they conducted a thorough investigation and all signs pointed to Dad's death being a suicide and to being guilty of all the crimes the note confessed to. John Malcolm, formerly known to my mother as the most devoted husband she could have ever asked for, to my sister as greatest daddy ever, exclamation, exclamation, one. <laughs> that was what she called him online, word for word. Respected by everyone in his church and community, and also the man I had one day hoped to be like when I grew up ever since I was six had gone to his grave labeled a liar, a coward, a hypocrite, and a child predator. To call that the darkest year of my family's life would be an insulting understatement. But even after two years of therapy and soul-searching, we still don't have a better term. Afterwards, though, a lot of people in the community started avoiding us. We became cursed to a lot of people. Everyone wondered how Mom could have missed such blatant hypocrisy in my father. Everyone wondered if my sister had also been abused. And just at the edge of my hearing, people wondered if my dad's behavior would be genetically passed down to me, if I would start displaying similar tendencies. I got cold shoulders in addition to the cold looks in the school hallways now. Older people who knew me made this weird, forced smile when they had to talk to me, and the church youth group leader stopped inviting me to help out with the children's vacation Bible school activities every summer. So, yeah, table to myself. No problem. No crowd of people coming up to talk to me about how things are going. No one coming up and saying, Hey, Wes, may I sit here? <laughs> no. Hey, Wes. How are things going? Is it all right if I sit here? Huh? 